Okay, good evening, good afternoon, possibly even good morning, depending which part of the world you're in. Um, welcome to Lacan in Scotland. It's lovely to be back. We had a bit of a, a hiatus over um, October when our event had to be cancelled. Um, so I haven't seen you all since September, but it's great to have you back and great to be back here. Um, and we have um, a fantastic session lined up for this evening. Um, we don't have any December sessions left lined up because of um, Christmas break, etc. Um, but we will be back in the new year um, with an exciting program. So if you're not already signed up to our website and our newsletter, um, then um, sign up for that. You'll get notification for our um, schedule for the new year, which will involve um, Leon Brenner, Jameson Webster, um, and a few other people as well. So an exciting program for them. Without further ado, it's an absolute pleasure this evening, it's beyond a pleasure, to welcome and introduce Bracha Ettinger. I first encountered Bracha about 15, 16 years ago um, at a conference in Dublin um, where it was a conference on Antigone and Bracha was one of the keynote speakers. And I'm slightly embarrassed to say this in front of Bracha, but I had never heard of her at this point, didn't know who this woman who was giving the keynote was. Um, and I sat there with no real um, expectations, um, either positively or negatively, and I was utterly blown away. Um, most of you, and um, probably all of you, spend a significant part of your life going to conferences, and you probably know the experience, my experience, when you go to conferences. And a lot of what you hear is arguments being rehearsed, ideas with which you're already somehow familiar, being trotted out, maybe taken into slightly different angles. But it's rare at a conference to encounter something brand new. And when I heard Bracha give her keynote address, I was absolutely struck with the, the freshness. I wasn't hearing the same old ideas being rehearsed, revisited, tweaked. I was hearing thinking in action and it was like a an almost physical jolt through me um i was absolutely stunned and I, I left the conference and as quickly as i could tried to devour everything of brachas that i could find and it wasn't that easy at that point to find a lot of brachas writings it's become a lot easier since then and she's um, recently published a collection with Paul Grave and there is I hope a, a second collection coming hopefully very soon from Paul Grave and then there will be subsequent collections of her work coming out and we're lucky enough to work with Bracca um, on the subsequent collections as well and if you're not familiar with Bracca's work I hope that you enjoy the same experience that I did 16 years ago and you get that jolt and are driven to discover her work and go out, find her work, read her work, read it again, and then read it again. So it's not always work that you can grasp first time around. I don't, don't think it's even work that's intended to be grasped the first time around. It's work that draws you in and you have to start questioning your own way of thinking things in order to follow Bracha in the various paths that she'll lead you down. Um, it's worth doing. And I hope tonight's um, if you've not already started that journey, I hope tonight is the beginning of that journey for all of you. Bracha, as it's fairly obvious from my introduction, is, um, is a thinker, is a writer, is a theorist. But she's not only a thinker, a writer, and a theorist, she's also an analyst, um, and she's also a very accomplished artist. And she, her artwork, as I understand it, occupies... Um, a greater and greater part of her life um, and she is actively um, presenting her artwork and she currently has an exhibition on in Torino in Italy and um, specifically I have the details here um, it's a solo show at the Castello di Rivoli Museum of Contemporary Art in Torino and if you're lucky enough to get to Italy then um, go um, enjoy Seabracha's work in the flesh as it were um, I think you'll be as stunned and impressed with the artwork as you are with the theory. And I think my understanding is the two are very much um, part of the same body of work. Um, so it's not simply reading Bracha that's important, but seeing the, the visual art that she produces is equally important. But tonight we have the pleasure of not only seeing Bracha, but listening to Bracha. Um, so Bracha, welcome. 
Thank you very much, Kalium, for inviting me and for this uh, occasion and for this very lovely presentation. Recently, when I when I prepared the exhibition in Castello di Rivoli, I went over, I glimpsed over uh, notebooks because these are part of the show. And I came over notebooks um, from eight, 1988, 1989, which is not 16 years ago, but closer to 32 years ago. From the 1989, a notebook, my attention was drawn to, to this line. Time is pregnant with the impression of loss. Conceive of the eclipse, that instant when the instant turns its back. Before that, in, in the notebook in 1985, I found the end comes around to the beginning when everything is put in words. La mémoire de l'oubli, memory of oblivion. And in between, in 1988, uh, I found this line. Itai, that's my son, my second child, is born. Repetition always of this idea. I'm no longer free to begin all over again. And also prohibition against dying for an indefinite time. And when I read it, I was a bit surprised that I, thought, I felt I'm still uh, turning around this question, not of not being free to, to die or to approach an end, but no longer being free to begin all over again, which means that that moment, a moment of birthing, is in, in all the senses that psychoanalysis can apply to it, is a trauma. Not to the newborn, not the trauma of birth, but to the one who gives birth, which means that it puts the clock again on a certain zero, and you cannot go and reattune the other zero moments from before. But this zero is not one like a zero and one. It is um, already a joint, a joint uh, event, an encounter event. So I'm moving to something that I would like to read from Jacques Lacan in 1979, in order to say that up until uh, the end of his teaching, and even when he was thinking about the feminine beyond the phallus, what is called the feminine beyond the phallus, and even after he formulated formulas of sexuation where the woman escapes the phallic uh, domain, he is unable to find an entry, to find an opening through which to go through that beyond and say something which is not in terms of loss, or negativity or impossibility or any kind of absence that you will choose in each period, it's another kind of absence, but in the end, the, the formula is that whatever we are able to formulate becomes by definition controlled through the phallic uh, field. So there's no way out. And so he left us with a very said uh, inheritance, but it is not more said than before, because as you will see, with Freud, we are also in a kind of a said horizon and psychoanalysis is full of this kind of a paradigm, which again and again foreclosed the feminine and afraid of articulating concepts that go through the margin and the threshold. And and put aside, in a sense, this paradigm. So Lacan writes in 79, I didn't find the English translation, I'll translate as I read. Je suis plutôt embêté, I'm rather annoyed, or bothered, or worried, de ce que je vous annoncé la dernière fois, of what I told you the last time. 
à savoir qu'il faut un troisième sexe, that we need a third sex. Ce troisième sexe ne peut pas subsister, this third sex cannot subsist, survive, remain, exist, en présence de deux autres, when the two others are present. Uh, the two others is the feminine and the masculine. Il y a un forçage, there is a pressure or a push, influence, qui s'appelle l'initiation, which is called initiation. And here, pay attention to a paradox. The psychoanalysis is set in anti-initiation. Psychoanalysis is against, is anti-initiation. Initiation, c'est pourquoi on s'élève tout à tout phallus. It what amounts to the phallus. You know, initiation have many meanings. Usually uh, there is the initiation rites where culture um, invites you to become a member of itself. It passed through rites of initiation. This is one of the meaning. Another is the meaning of a certain long teaching where you become acquainted with certain concepts in the field. And he says, no, psychoanalysis is trying to be the opposite of that, anti-that. Uh, but, c'est, he doesn't say but, c'est par commode de savoir ce qu'il est. It is not easy to know what is initiation or not. Here he goes. How can we, how can, how could I say that psychoanalysis is anti-initiation? Who knows what is initiation? But in general, it is what we incorporate through initiation is the phallus, is the phallic field. So, there is a need that in the absence of initiation, we would be a man or we would be a woman. So is it in absence of initiation or is it because of initiation that we are being a man or a woman? I put these as questions because he says in the absence of initiation must be, one must be a man or a woman. Well, he ends it like this, well. So is there initiation or is there not initiation in psychoanalysis? And if there is, would it not be better that it will be visible and approachable and we'll be able to analyze it and even criticize it rather than believing that there is no initiation? And this is 79. And when, when there is the question of there should be, for example, um, no school, or there should be a school where there will be the pass, where somebody will pass, is the pass not an initiation, not a part of, here we are, a part of a group, a part of a culture to which we adhere. Now, about that, I'm going to say there is another kind of initiation, which is obvious in psychoanalysis and which enters the and change the question of the relationship, the question of transference, what happens between the patient and the analyst. And then, of course, when we speak about patient and analyst, we can also take away um, the, the, this positioning and talk about any relations, a relation where we are attached to one another and which is long, take a long time, there is this um, moment, not moment, a thread of initiation. Now, I would say the generation of women poets and artists struggle in the 20th and 21st century. I limit myself to artists and poets and writers that I know. So most of them are Western, but there's also African-American uh, like Toni Morrison, And these artists and, and writers pay with their body for their attempts to discern a certain kind of life drive. But this life drive instantly turns itself into a death drive 
as it formulates itself of necessity inside this Western cultural inheritance. Yet these poets that some of them I will uh, talk about today or writers persist in the attempt to discern a language for a unique passing through, which I name feminine, though it is a feminine matrixial in my language that escapes the men-women dichotomy, the dichotomy that reveals itself when inspiration avoids itself and forecloses in its disappearance, a specific kind of unconscious initiation on which we are going to talk. So what is it that culture and language and Western language endlessly sidetrack Side tracking us from, there is a longing that I think most of us can feel for this almost impossible passage, a passage from non-life to life, where non-life does not equal death. So much so that even a woman writer presents the egg as the split flip side of the chicken, up to the possibility of sacrificing one's own body to knowledge. So much so that even a woman writer and psychoanalyst celebrates the object of the maternal and present pregnancy as psychosis. Here I refer to Kristeva, and before that I, I prefer I refer to Clarice Lispector that we are going to read together. The affective knowledge of this passage manifests itself in its almost impossibility to grasp. In unique time-space body constellation, the unconscious initiation by inspiration of the passage through a non-life coming into life up to thinking birth with birthing is possible. I talk, of course, about the metaphor, birth, birthing, pregnancy as metaphors, but there is also the bodies that are concerned, bodies that are, can give birth potentially or don't have to, and our bodies in the sense that we have all been born. And since we have all been born, we know something about it, um, a knowledge without, with very few language, with a little language, but we know. So let's think of it as a possible conveyance in transference. I uh, such a conveyance that which is transported is dri driven by driven by a life drive, which is beyond the life drive described by Freud, and from Freud onward, and by Lacan, and even by Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari. Unfortunately, this kind of life drive, as I said, is fatally turned again and again into a death wish under the confines of a culture that ignores and still largely ignores the feminine unconscious sphere. Feminine libido is out of the question and er feminine eros or matrixial eros. Remember when Freud said there's only one libido and the way this one libido is, um, is uh, conceived of is in terms of the up active and its opposite is passive and so on and so on. So there's only one which must manifest itself in this activity, in a certain activity. So what is this, this ever deepening confusion between life drive and death drive, that's one of my claims, at the heart of it and our basic paradigm. This is what also pathologize, make us, uh, you know, make it uh, sickness. Our glimpses of a sensibility 
that goes beyond the limits of this realm. As I review uh, with love and with art and uh, the writing and the poetry of certain artists and writers, I see to what an extent the rebellion and even revolutionary vision become fatally amalgamated with death drives. Yet we can still get a sense of these, their singular insistence on dwelling on the threshold of a borderline zone, being attracted and repulsed by the return of this passage between non-life and life, mistakenly taken to signify death. With the term conveyance then, which echoes other terms that I'm using in order to draw a field to which we, we must pay attention in my view, the term carrions um, echoes another term I'm using a lot uh, that I designate uh, as fascinance, a field of caring and carrying, which I uh, called carrions. All of those form a certain uh, orientation. And this orientation is a kind of unconscious participation inside but also a side of the intersubjective relations, the relations between one and another in psychoanalysis. So we will pa pay attention to what during transference could be a process of unconscious initiation and ins uh, inspiration, which can go beyond the lack and beyond resistance and rebellion and even sacrifice into caring, responding, responding through care, care, care responding, I can even say. A few more words, uh, the being towards birthing with being towards birth implies rethinking the concept of death instinct and death drive as well as those of life instinct and life drive, eros and libido. This is a bit more, it complicates the picture because I'm going to show that uh, what is called life drive in psychoanalysis ignores the life circle of a human being. And therefore what is uh, called life drive according to which we orient ourselves is also a kind of death drive. Um, I will talk about sublimation relating to the female body and elaborate is symbolic related to the real of her corporeality, but also to the sub-real. It is, uh, in my view, useful to talk about not only real, or in terms of art, uh, surre surreal, surrealism, but sub-realities in the sense that we are dealing with encounters of entities that are only part of our definition of self, but have their create their own relationship with partial subjectivity of others with or without our acknowledgement. So with such a symbolic uh, that includes such sublimation of real and subreality, we can move. This is uh, one of the points I want to make from a subject defined through being towards death. This is Heidegger, but finally this is also Freud. subject as being towards death only to a subject who is also being towards birth with being towards birthing. Uh, we have to bridge, you know, thousand years of civilization to start to include the feminine, uh, but it's, it's never too late or maybe it's too late, I don't know. Now, uh, 
already I start to jump because I know that we will not have time for um, everything. But uh, I'm jumping in order to introduce a few more concepts through which we are, I'm, I'm working, okay? One of them is copoiesis. Because when I talk about birth with birthing, uh, where I'm talking about copoiesis, co-emergence with, which relates to a notion um, brought uh, forward by a friend of mine, Varela, Francisco Varela. Autopoiesis relates to the self-maintaining chemistry, even at a cellular level, but also metaphorical level, around a self for whom that which is not I is an object of its interests expressed via, via its rejection or its assimilation in symbiosis. Symbiosis can occur between any living basic substances, if we talk about sub-reality. Endless connectivity is not our problem. There is endless connectivity. But in what sense the human being is concerned by that is the question. So the ethics of copoiesis is not the ethics of symbiosis and autopoiesis. And uh, this means that for every alliance between that which is I and that which is non-I, we have to think about differences differentiating in jointness, not symbiosis, but not rejection or objection. We talk about affective arousal and emotional catharsis and human care and communicating. I would like to read to you from Clarice Lispector, no, maybe first, I might first read to you from Lacan to get us into the mood, and then we'll go to Clarice Lispector, who writes in 64, and you will see to what an extent what she writes in 64 and what Lacan writes in 64 have a resonance and relationship, and in fact, uh, inquiring around some kind of intuition where both surprisingly enough arrive to the same conclusion that it's either, either the chicken or the egg, either me or you. Lacan writes, that's the famous passage on the lamella, we cannot do without it. Whenever the membrane of the egg in which the fetus emerges on its way to becoming a new born are broken, imagine for a moment that something flies off and that one can do it with an egg as easily as with a man, namely the homelet or the lamella. The lamella is something extra flat. It's a unicell, you know, it's a kind, something which has, a, it's a, a kind of a unicell. It is something extra flat, which moves like the ameba. It is just a little more complicated, but it goes everywhere. And as it is something, I will tell you shortly why, that is related to what the sexed being loses in sexuality. This will take us to Freud and to the idea that in order to be born, in order to be born, we are also giving up immortality. Immortality belongs to the unicells that can split themselves forever and the ameba and the lamella and any creatures on, the, on that uh, uh, micro level that subsist by cutting themselves into more and more and more parts, right? So human being, when it is born, is gives up immortality. And so while being sexed, we are losing in, in that kind of becoming through sexuality, the possibility of living forever. 
It is like the ameba in relation to sex being immortal. So Lacan says to us, there is something which is immortal in us. This something is not um, lost when we are, uh, uh, when the, the creature, human being continue to, to evolve, but it is lost for us when we give up being like ameba, okay? So why it is immortal? Because it survives any division, any ciciparious intervention, because it survives um, and it can run around, it can run around. Well, this is not very reassuring, but suppose it comes, I continue to quote, yeah? But suppose it comes and envelop your face while you are quietly asleep. I can't see how we would not join battle with a being capable of these properties, but it would not be a very convenient battle. The lamella, this organ, whose characteristic is to not exist, but which is nevertheless an organ, is the libido. Here we go. Libido is and life drive are compared in fact, to the life of the unicells and the ameba. And we can ask ourselves, so what about a life drive in terms of humanized life? And you're going to see how this echo Freud, echoes Freud, and we are in a very serious matter. Lacan is right to say that uh, that this is the kind of a libido that we are talking about because it's in Freud as well. It has never been otherwise. And so if it has never been otherwise, no wonder that we cannot imagine in terms of life drive, the question of love and the question of care. So I return to Lacan. This is the libido as a pure life instinct, that is to say, immortal life or irrepressible life, life that has, no, that has need of no organ, simplified, indestructible life. It is precisely, precisely what is subtracted from the living being by virtue of the fact that it is subject to the cycle of sexed reproduction. And it is of this that all the forms of object A, the object in psychoanalysis and object A stands for the loss of an object and the object that is lost is parts of the maternal and also parts of my, my body and in general, the maternal, the mother. So here we go. This is pure life instinct, that is to say immortal life, a life that has no has need of no organs, simplified, indestructible. It is precisely what is abstracted from the living being by virtue of the fact that it is subject to the cycle of, cycle of sex reproduction. And it is this, that all the forms of the object A that can be enumerated are the representatives, the equivalents, the object, A, the object A are merely its representative, its figures. The breast as equivocal, as an element characteristic of the mammiferous organization. The placenta, for example, certainly represent that part of himself that the individual loses at birth and which may serve to symbolize the most profound lost object. Now, Clarice Lispector. I see the egg. I look at the egg with a single gaze. While one cannot be seeing an egg, seeing an egg never remains in the present. As soon as I see an egg, it already becomes having seen an egg three millennia ago. At the very instant of seeing the egg, it is the memory of an egg. 
the egg can only be seen by one who has already seen it. When one sees the egg, it is too late. An egg seen is an egg lost. Seeing the egg is the promise of one day eventually seeing the egg. A brief and indivisible glance. If indeed there is thought, there is none. There is the egg. Looking is the necessary instrument that once used, I shall discard. I shall keep the egg. The egg is no itself. Individually, it does not exist. Seeing the egg is impossible. The egg is super visible, just as there are supersonic sounds. Love for the egg cannot be felt either. Love for the egg is super sensible. We do not know what we that we love the egg. When I was ancient, I was keeper of the egg. I would, and I would tread lightly to avoid unpending the egg's silence. When I died, they removed the egg from me with care. It was still alive. It, that which we cannot become aware of. Yeah, it was still alive. Only one, we, one who saw the world would see the egg. Like the world, the egg is obvious. The egg no longer exists, like the light, etc. She continues to speak about this exactly in the way that Lacan speak about the object of the gaze, that which can see me, but I cannot really see. The egg is invisible to the naked eye, etc. From one egg to another, one arrives at God, who is invisible to the naked eye. And then she continue and explain that she can either be a chicken or, a, or an egg, the chicken cannot uh, have, know anything about the egg and the egg doesn't care about the chicken. And that the chicken is a vehicle in order that the eggs can move from generation to generation. So this is precisely also the notion of the Freudian life drive and the Lacanian life drive. It can move from generation to generation, ignoring the circle of a human life and therefore, finally, also ignoring the maternal, ignoring um, birthing and starting the story from a birth of a subject. Now, this kind of uh, perception or conception of a life drive brings the poets and the artists that I analyzed each time to the point of a desire to die in order to try to say something about what I believe to be, the desire to reach that passage from non-life to life. But since non-life is always imagined as death, it becomes a desire to die, whether it is Sylvia Platt, whether it is Alessandra Pizarnik, and I can give uh, more examples. Alessandra Pizarnik, before we go to Freud, we need a little more poetry. Here she goes. All night long, I hear the calling of death. All night long, I hear the chant of death alongside the river. All night long, I hear the voice of death calling to me. My head suddenly seems to want to come out of my uterus now as if the poetic corpse were to force by interrupting reality, it to force it to be born. And there is someone in my throat, someone who was gestating in solitude. I, unfinished, eager to be born, open myself up, and so on. Speak. She says, speak about the scene of ashes, speak, but from the bottom of the river where singing death is. Now we go to Freud, then to Lacan, and then we will return to the question of the feminine 
possibility uh, bringing into psychoanalysis from the meaning matrix point of view, another kind of life drive that uh, Karen called the uh, boldly novel uh, life drive. And I accept I accept uh, your definition. I, I would have never be so bold, but uh, because what is for Freud libido, to which I think after 2000 years of uh, civilization, we should simply say no. You know, it doesn't bring the feminine and the maternal into consideration. Here is libido. We form the idea that there is, that there being an original libidinal catharsis of the ego, from which some is later given off to objects, but which fundamentally persists and is related to the object catharsis, much as the body of an amoeba is related to the pseudopodia which it puts out. You see symbiosis and you see amoeba. I continue with Freud. Throughout the whole of life, the ego remains the great survivor from which libidinal catharsis are sent out to objects and into which they are also once more withdrawn, just as an abeba behaves with its pseudopodia. Continue. So as I said, human life drives are patterned on these germ cells, unicells, uh, metazoa, amoeba, and other biological multi, you know, uh, unicellular um, organism. And when we read beyond the pleasure principle, we still see that this uh, meta psychology is kept. In the discussion of repetition compulsion that resist the pleasure principle, Freud elaborates on the distinction between bound and free energy in relation to the life drive that in fact immortality of germ cells. And this drive is assigned to talk about the mortal, to talk about us. If there would have been a consideration and understanding that the principle of the beginning of life and the principle of the end of life are not the same, that there is no, uh, if there would have been any consideration of humanizing the process through which we come into life, like uh, our mother's pregnancy to us, if this would have been humanized, then we would have another, we do have, because I'm, I'm doing it, trying to do it for many years, we do have a possible other kind of life, life drive that manifests itself. But with Freud, we are still in that uh, definition but the human being is defined through its mortality, which brings us to Heidegger and being towards death and show us that it's a whole structure, a philosophical structure that accompanies us uh, until today. Because as Freud continued, the aim of life is death. Inanimate things existed before living one. The first instinct came into being the instinct to return to the inanimate state, and so on. The organism wishes to die only in its own fashion. So the only thing we are given to as human being, I think that existentialists took that from Freud, what is given to us is only to choose how to die. The rest is already, we are being towards death, so we can make a choice. At least, <laughs> at least we can make a choice to, to commit suicide like uh, Alejandra Pizarnik, the, the poet that I was uh, quoting. Interestingly enough, I went deeply into her uh, account of her analysis, and I went deeply into the account of Sylvia Platt's analysis 
day by day, like diary analysis, to show, and I, uh, these are other articles that I hope you, you would wish to, to read, I'll, I'll give you the references, where it is clearly that the analytical uh, interpretation push, push the subject in a direction that cannot support life, cannot support a woman's life, because it is based on the rejection of the archaic, of the maternal, and of anything which is can uh, a body can imagine uh, as as what we want or as we don't want or as we what we refuse, but still we need to imagine, not as a principle of a body which is different, like male body, female body, trans body, but as a principle of co-emergence which is another principle of subjectivity that I'm trying to talk about. Transjectivity, transsubjectivity, the co-poiesis, the co-emergence, co-fading, that which does not, that is in this co before and alongside any imagination of subject alone separated and <clears throat> with its ego and so on. Thus, this kind of life drives, also in Lacan, as we just uh, saw, this kind of libido, is the life, in fact, support the life of elementary organism and has no interest whatsoever in the human individual organism, in our life struggles, and in our cultural achievement. Neither in the body or even animal body, any body that is amalgamated already and bigger than unicells is not considered. Um, so what we see here is that we, this, what is called life drive is a kind of a death drive in disguise. And so I quoted uh, like Freud at length to give you an idea how far this uh, is imprinted inside the theory. But we could also say that with this kind of imagination of life drive, it is no wonder the way that we are rejecting and finally polluting and addressing anything which is, you know, the earth and the water and anything that make us live and give us life enters into these definitions of the, that which can be rejected. And it can go into all kinds of imagination, putting together the archaic maternal with the nations and with, uh, I don't know, all kinds of figures of imagination possible, especially in 20th century, to, to almost uh, initiate us into non-respect of anything which is not self, not I. So with the, with the, with the matrixial, our attention, my attention is also drawn to this uh, possibility of jointness in differentiation, which is not symbiosis. We don't have to imagine the human being as either in symbiosis or in kind of a rejection. And the maternal is a possibility of either what we reject or what will swallow us. In fact, Freud says, and I think uh, I'd like to quote that in order to, to leave Freud in peace, the most universal endeavor, I quote, of all living a substance, namely to return to the quiescence of the inorganic world, he continues on that, at the beginning of mental life, there are no others. The pleasure principle seems actually to serve the death instincts. More clear than that, in the beginning of mental life, there are no others. Uh, I claim from the feminine in the matrixial 
from the beginning of mental life, I am known, I negotiate. And at the period where they don't, we cannot uh, say much about that, but we cannot say, we don't need to speculate uh, on that. But um, there is a knowledge of us being carried into, carried into life in a human way, in transconnecting to a female body, in transcending these aff affects that come through this conjunction. And if Lacan says somewhere that we, we cannot talk about that which is before subject, uh, he even says, I quote the him long time ago somewhere else, whoever will dare to, to say so will be banned from the psychoanalytical community. So there is a taboo. And with uh, Kristeva, we can see that taboo as, you know, if I feel something about being pregnant, this is my psychosis. So we are psychotic and we, we know nothing. And, you know, the chicken knows nothing about the egg and so on and so on. So this is the taboo and the censorship are very, very deep, putting all of us at risk of saying anything. When Lacan speak in 1973 in the seminar Encore, he says women know nothing about their sexuality and if they, if they would have known, they would have said something. But the proof of the matter is that they cannot say anything, which means they, they feel something or something exists for them, but of which no symbolization is possible. And if it is symbolized, it symbolize, it is symbolized in terms of the negative. So as you see the Freudian life drives through the feminine and the angle of the matrixial is revealed to be insufficient. It's not that what he says is irrelevant. It is very relevant, but it is not sufficient. It is a dehumanizing factor. And it dynamizes a certain dehumanization. And the, it dynamizes the incapacity to relate to transitions, to zones that are more fluid. And I'm not going with the lesson glottary either because the endless fluidity is not the reply to the rigidity of the Oedipus positions or the rigidity of identities and gender identity. Uh, it is not a reply because it's, it's the negative, it's the anti. And suddenly the feminine is associated with endless fluid and thousand fragmentation. No. When I talk about copoiesis and co-emergence, and I keep this um, imagine, imaginary of pre-life and pre-maternality, it means that there are relations, not between everything and everything, but between I and non-I that can be uh, effectively related, related, where I'm investing, that's where responsibility can enter the, the picture. Because in endless uh, fragmentation and fluidity, ethics cannot play a role. We, we fall into the same problematic. So in this article, I talk about this loss of uh, immortality and all of that, which is taken there later on by Margulis and today is taken by other theorists and even feminist theorists who go along, go along with the Deleuzean endless fragmentation and fluidity. And I think finally find themselves in the domain of symbiosis and not in the domain of um, differentiating in jointness which is uh, our metaphor. Now the less interestingly enough also says the turning point of Freudianism appears in beyond the pleasure principle, 
The death instinct is discovered not in connection with the destructive tendency, not in connection with aggressivity, but as a result of a direct consideration of repetition phenomena. Strangely, the death instinct serves as a positive originary principle for repetition. And we can add that the life drive serves as something which is more deadening. Um, I know that we don't have enough time and I promise to give, uh, to give you the paper in a month's time. I could send it to everybody where it is going to be uh, printed. The, um, I explain here also that with this kind of life, new life drive, this humanized, matrixially humanized life drive, uh, where we are talking about being between birth and death, being towards birthing, with being towards birth, this also supplies us with response, ethics of responsibility for the future, the future of the non-I and the future of the environment, which does not lean simply only on anxiety, shame, guilt, and then like Melanie Klein with reparation. The principle of love in that is not reparative. With Melanie Klein, you know, the, the non-I is rejected. And then the human psyche is doing a reparative gesture of love. Even if she says you, that love could be as hate, a very primordial capacity, when you read the details with Melanie Klein, love is reparative, it comes after. And I don't see how we can imagine, how could we have imagined a human subjectivity that, I, I mean, a human subject would not survive one day if the primordial mechanism are hate and reject and rage and everything imagined by Melanie Klein, to which then we reply by, okay, I feel guilty and therefore I will love you. I, for me, one of the, Primordial principles is compassion, compassion. And we cut the word compassion. So I'd like to finish, if we have time, with Alejandra Pizarnik. That I more or less, when I started, I said that in her. She is looking for something else and she's finding again and again the formulas of death. But I don't know if we have time. Uh, you have to tell me if we can still quote some of Alejandra Pizarnik or no. Yes, no, please do. Carry on. Mm, sure. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. This one is from 62. Um, as you see, I stay today with a lot of, uh, with Lacan from 64, basically, mainly, even though we go to 73 and then 79, and with poets who are writing at that moment. Alejandra Pizarnik, um, these are, I don't know if these are the formal translations. I worked on her and gave some lectures in 2012, and the translators, the translator was kind enough to give me a work in a progress. Remind me, I will tell you his name. Anyway, so that's from 62, Tree of Diana. I've taken the plank from me to dawn. I've left my body along with the light. I've sung the sadness of what's born. I quote in a lines by lines, but not in continuity. They are not linear lines. 
Beware of me, my love. Beware of the silent one in the desert, of her shadow's shadow. She's scared of not knowing how to name what does not exist. To explain with words from this world that a boat from me has shoved off with me on board. Like a poem aware of the silence of things, you speak so as not to see me. At night, a mirror for the dead little girl, an ashen mirror. These threads imprison the shadows and demand an answer for the silence. These threads unite the gaze and the sorrow. You step away from the names that thread the silence of things together. Threading the silence of things together. I think it's a wonderful metaphor. Here we live with one hand in the throat. That nothing is possible they already know. Those inventors of rain who wove words together in the torment of absence. Eyes and an ache truly far too great. We pluck the mirrors until the forgotten words magically rings. And Pisanik says somewhere, she writes, rebellion consists in staring at a rose until the eyes turn to dust. It is this dust and these ashes that give a, mi a mirror to that which is silenced. And she's asking the ashes to say her. One more line of her, and I will end with that line, is I miss distancing myself from the time when I was born. I miss not carrying out the newcomer role more. So not I miss being a new more born, not I desire to return to the womb or to the moment of birth or that repetition, but I miss this moving modus, the mode of distrust, distancing from such a way of becoming that was mine, which was I, and this uh, joining, I would dare interpret as the joining of a joining, not joining the I that is separate, but not entering into this deadly symbiosis, which will then call her into her destiny. Thank you. Thank you, Bracha. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to open things up to questions now. Um, so it seems like it's silence at the end of someone talking there. In, in real life, when we're all in the same room, we tend to clap at this point, but we're all on mute. So, Bracha, you have to imagine a, a round of applause. Um, but we'll now move into to questions. Um, as I said at the but beginning... everybody's silent for the moment. There is a silence? There's or involuntary silence. Ah, okay. Silence. Oh. The silence of the living. Um, so if you have questions, if you can stick your hand up or um, indicate in the chat, we'll try and um, we'll try and pick everyone up who has questions. Um, Brian, I'm, I'll start things off as I usually do with a, a question for you. And um, there, there was a moment in your you talk tonight which seemed to me to to very clearly articulate what I understand to be something at the very core of your your ideas, your theory, your kind of ongoing building of, of this theory, this idea around the matrixial. 
Um, and as when you, you turn to Freud and the, the quotation from Freud that in the beginning of the mental life there is there is no other so in the beginning of the mental life there is no difference and um, this seems to be something so I mean, you know when I started reading your works it struck me very immediately this idea of um, rather than that um, fantasized unity that we get from Freud that in the beginning there is a unity and it's that unity we always hark back to. Did you posit against that, this idea of a, in the beginning, to speak of beginnings, there is a, there is a difference, there's a coming, a coming together, copiosis, um, co-emergence, which seems to me to instill an idea of, a, a, instills an idea of a creativity, a positivity, which, as I understand tonight, this is what's is the embryo so I mix my metaphors there. There's, here's the embryo of this, what I named your novel idea of a life drive. That it, it emerges from this, um, this copiosis, this, this co-emergence, this um, co-becoming, which strikes me as a rather. Um, th there's an echo of Levinas in here as well. It's almost a kind of um, Levinas in utero. And my question for you is... Really... No, that, that's... Uh, I, I dedicated a, uh, a paper to, to Levinas following long conversations we had and we printed because at the end of the day for Levinas and I really pushed him, I wanted an answer and he gave it in a beautiful and very renovating way, but he gave it. He says, I will not dare to go about any before. The moment there is a subject, and I speak only a subject that are in the world and so on, the moment it is, you know, is a moment of responsibility, etc. And the feminine is the absolute other. So any part, so they are very, you know, they are people of their moment each from a very different angle, bringing to the fore the idea that the woman and the feminine is that absolute otherness. And I say to him, but we could take what you say and I'll give it the kick. And I will look at it from a matrixial perspective because that's, that's how I want to read you. And from that perspective, I would say that father and son in your writing is a matrixial relation, father and son, because it talks about the, the transmissivity and initiation and finally the metaphor of birth, if you want. But the woman as the absolute alterity is what we have to confront. So with Levinas, I share a lot concerning this ethical approach to that which is not me. But I'm saying the foundation of that and, and Levinas will say, and I don't care about psychoanalysis and psychology, all I talk about is ethics. And I said, no, 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 wait a minute, because the foundation of it rejects rejects the, the feminine as that which is absolutely outside. And for him, it is because it is absolutely outside, it calls for ethical, etc. No, I say jointness in differentiation is primordial. And for Levinas, the primordiality is the responsibility for the face of the other and the face of the other is never a presence and the alterity of the feminine is like the big alterity with, with Lacan, finally, in that same period. Even though he changed, the, you know, he changed over the time. The definition of the feminine he gives me is not the definition he gave 20 years before that, that uh, Lucy Rigai criti criticized and so on. So the, the compassion and the question of responsibility, I... I join Levinas and I thank Levinas and I think he's wonderful. But he remains in that paradigm which finally 
puts the, the chicken of the egg as a sacrifice, Sacrif must sacrifice. So all of those have to get some kind of, a, you know, re restart for, for our time. Yeah, no, I follow you there, um, which is fascinating and, and really helpful. And I think really helps to orientate your thinking in relation to Levinas. But the question I was going to ask was, and I think this does in, in ways go back to Levinas, even though I think your, your interjection there helps to, to clarify a really important distinction. But there is a one thing that strikes me in Levinas is there is a positivity in Levinas that, you know, the idea of this um, return to um, an, an ethics as first philosophy is, is to put a, a positivity in the idea of responsibility in the face of the other, etc. Yeah. And I think there is an echo of that in your work. And that really, the question I wanted to ask is what, other than a, a, a pure choice to go to that direction, what is there to bring us to that that positivity, that to see in that, um, what we might call an inaugural or you know, an ancient difference, what is it that sees that brings us to see that as a coasis, something constructive, positive, and hopeful? And I mean, this is what I read in your work. There is a a, a turn mm. which is very hopeful, and yet we live in a world which seems on the face of it, much more Hegelian, where our instinct to, or our drive is to destroy the other, to, to see the other in opposition rather than in a productive difference. Uh, absolutely, this paradigm won, you know, <laughs> is still winning the, to conceive, you know, it is hard to imagine that co-emergence is so basic that when you destroy that which is non I, you destroy yourself. And we start, we have to start to imagine a new when you, you know, when you pollute the water, you destroy yourself, maybe not now, but in 10 years' time. When you exploit the earth until it cannot, you know, breathe anymore and fill it with plastic, you kill yourself. It's not. It is never like, uh, okay, my profit, your loss. You know, this is a huge mechanism to which we have been driven through generations you know, of cultural understanding that even started the question of value because we cherish what we value. And so if we value more money, then we start to cherish uh, money. And if we value, now to value the, the care, caring you know, and to realize that it is never just for the other, it is, you know, means uh, another uh, a supplementary basis for understanding subject which is not just, okay, that which supplements the phallus or that which will, we will not be able to articulate. Levinas, I remember he once said to me, and I liked it very much, um, but this was also the position of Lyotard as well, from whom I also learned one or two things. We had huge discussions on that question. So what if everything is also taken to the phallus while we are talking in language? So what? Does it mean that really everything, that that language encompasses everything and decides, decides the, the destiny of the thing? So there, there, the, the leftovers are, are what we are dealing with. And by the way, in contemporary art, also for a long time now. But I will also say, I talk about um, more fragility. I'm not saying we are going to have more pleasures, less pain. I'm talking about that if for Levinas, the other is vulnerable and therefore you have to tend to the other to be, yeah? 
it's not enough because we will have no ground where to start as exactly as you put it where okay so the other is vulnerable and therefore i am responsible but i might ignore it and i say no the it me if the other is more vulnerable and you want to uh, admit that into a part of your life it, the there is a cost to pay which i call self fragilization you give up some of your power because in self fragilization you really connect to that which is vulnerable in the other and this could be painful but who said that you know when something is painful then you uh, then we are less you know who said that we need to enjoy all the time for that there is uh, addiction <laughs> you can be addicted and enjoy all the time that's not but uh, now where what is the foundation of that is that that you wouldn't be alive if nobody cared for you you know there is something so basic that we reject when we take the the idea that there was symbiosis and from there on to become a subject we need to reject the non i freud even defines that which is non i true rejection do you remember this quote we can quote freud on that how does the subject realize that there is something else than itself that's the legend of freud and of philosophy true rejection because i reject and so what you have is that the non i is defined through rejection this should have surprised us the not to, to to define the non i through rejection we cannot get rid of that so i'm not saying it's more uh, pleasurable or any paradise but if we want to bring into account past and future and present and the circle of life in which we have been born and we carry the traces of this conjunctions kind of differentiation and jointness with us just if we loosen this the ego subject then we realize that you suddenly realize the other is also a subject not just the object that you define through is it dangerous for me is it not you know there's a lot of danger in caring and you probably going to suffer or i mean every mother knows that what's the matter i mean just when lacan says when i talk about the feminine but certainly not about the mother that's another question okay it's another question but questions are related probably we have more knowledge about the female maternality uh, than anything else about the feminine so it doesn't make destiny it doesn't mean i'm going to think like this or like that this is our work so in some way i say that certain interpretation psychoticize the, the subject and to avoid this psychotization we become even more rigid and more egoistic and more ah oh, that's my interest and, and we don't realize that i and non i all the time coemerge if you are investing in in the non i and then if you are aware of what gives you more life and what takes away your life even in a delay you don't see it now but we can imagine the result of certain things what will apply to the i back again so so in levinas uh, what is missing for me is that coemergence which indeed to realize the, the vulnerability of the other we have to self fragilize ourselves and that self fragilization means that we are putting less on the sacrificial paradigms you know levinas is working not from the idea of birth even though he talks about the suffering of the you know it's a sentence from the bible that he quotes but his problem is that cain killed abel right 
And so we all have the tendency to kill, which we have to fight. Now, I'm not saying that's not valid. It is valid. But I start from a different uh, point of view. And something, you know, you can start even with Eva. Poor Eva, one, one child is a killer, the other is killed, and then she continues. And she, she gives birth to Seth, who gives birth to Enosh, which is in Hebrew human. So humanity didn't come from Cain, who killed, and not from Abel, who was already killed. So where is Eva in all that story? Right, I could keep talking with you all evening, but I'm aware that there are other people putting their hands up who are desperate to ask you some questions while they have the opportunity. So um, yeah. I'm going to invite some other... to see everybody. So, oh. Tina. Hi, Tina. Hello, Callum. Hello, Brackers. This is Tina Kinsler. Hi, Tina. Um, I just, I don't really have a question as much of, as a series of thoughts that... I, you know, it's more extrapolation from you, really, that um, I suppose I'm looking for. And can I just say, Callum, in your introduction, I thought the way you paid attention to the difference, radicality and profundity of Bracker's thought was is really important to make that statement, because um, even the fact that it's hard to find her work until more recently, which is true, um, and I've worked on Bracker's work and worked with Bracker quite closely for a long time. So I hope that my question isn't unhelpful for people because I have worked quite closely with Bracker. But um, listening to the discussion today, I was wondering if, um, if, if we could sort of think actually about where artistic practice is in all of this, because whenever Bracker, I mean, I think it's really clear to sort of say that Bracker's probably she would describe herself as an artist first before a theorist and a philosopher and an analyst and a psychoanalyst and all those things. And so I just want to ask something about what artistic practice can tell us about what is not taking to or under the, the, the phallus of language, as, as you mentioned, Brecker. So can you say a little bit more, because you started off with an observation about the body and, um, and you were speaking about that in relationship to the way you're trying to extrapolate upon life drive, death drive, non-life, non-life to life, and the relationship between that and the body, and to certain artists that um, are reaching towards understanding of non-life through bodily understanding, through experience, bodily experience, bodily metaphor, um, or through even, and maybe we could also think about this, lively or vivacious objects that appear in their work, so so-called objects that appear in their works, and certainly you've written about that in relationship to Sylvia Plath and spoken about it tonight in relationship to Alejandra Pizarnik. Um, or also, you've been there. You've been there in 2012 in a where was it in Holland in the Netherlands? That's right, in Utrecht, where I where I first talked about uh, Alejandra Pizarnik and work around these quotes. That's I right, remember. it was the first time, and it profoundly shaped my PhD back in that time on your work. You know, it really did, and, and it's profoundly shaped my thinking around artists' work. Um, and I suppose as well, this idea of co-emergence um, in symbolic devices, which, you know, we've spoken about such as animals, maybe occult practices um, or even natural elements like plant life or water, as you mentioned tonight. Um, and so this co-emergence of materialities, which you could speak about with other artists like Francesca Woodman or surrealist artists that we've spoken about. Yeah. Um, so how might this relate to your rereading of Lacan on the lamella? and what you were saying about subrealities and partial elements that are part of our reality, even if not acknowledged in language. Um, yeah. And birth as, um, uh, birth as an encounter event from non-life to life, 
um, that we all share as human beings, because I think that's very relevant to the conversation that you and Callum just had. It's like, you know, I think what you're proposing is that we have oriented all our questions and a certain understanding of subjectivity that is not premised upon birth and birthing. And why is that? We, we, you know, the great philosophical question is how to die rather than how we're we born. <laughs> and what knowledge does that donate us in terms of that? So our whole world, the questions that we ask and even why we come to questions are from the perspective of being born to a life to die rather than being born into a life that was through birthing, being birthed, and those of us that may give birth or may not give birth, um, but have all been birthed. So, so it's a bit meandering around. I'm hoping you'll stay with me, Brecca. So I'm sort of wondering like how the body and the feminine, as you relay it, um, and the special place maybe for artists in this address to the body, um, in terms of how you explain concepts like differentiation and jointness, um, co poesis subreality, carry ons all those concepts that you've introduced tonight, and how maybe they appear maybe in artistic practice uh, when language is a resistant to the symbolization for those kind of knowledges or experiences. Um, and maybe another thing that I'll add on that we've never spoken about, actually, but I, I'd just like to throw it in if you get a chance to speak about it tonight. Um, how this is related to what you say about love and sexuality and eros and how we could speak about this in relationship to these experiences and knowledges in what I'm just going to put under some kind of bracket of erotic experiences. Um, somehow that could be many things, but maybe how I might frame it would be experiences that take us outside of ourselves, or or um, put us in a position position of our knowledge and experience that is not related directly back to us as individual subjects. So that maybe undo us or you know unpractice us in certain ways. That that that's. That's a bit rambling, I'm sorry, but you've spoken about so much that I'm just trying to bring a lot of things together. Thank you, Tina. Tina is uh, being modest here, so I want to emphasize that Tina is working a lot on uh, artists, on women artists, on surrealist artists, 20th century, 21st century. She's a big expert. And of course, what you ask will uh, take us like a whole day of presentation. In each of my papers, I always, and also in the paper I presented here, but I did not read, I relate to art, to art making, art working, to my practice of art. And I always keep it mostly always in the last chapter and then I don't have time to read it, which is probably fine because I'm a bit shy. But I'm a painter and a lot of my uh, thoughts developed in the hours of big uh, solitude in the studio is between me and the color. The I and non-I was me and the pigment, the pigment who resists me and the pigment I try to understand. And then how color works and how color become lights, how, how certain colors never become lights. They're simply pigments. And, and so one might think that, that all these uh, notions arrived from collaborative work, but they did not. They direct towards possibilities in all kinds of collaborative works, and I see that happening, and it's wonderful. Uh, but probably uh, as a painter, you know, it was a question of thousands of hours of uh, solitudes and writing in the notebooks, which are now presented in the Castello di Rivoli in Torino. And sometimes I present them in museums, sometimes not. And fragments of thought arrive and I take them down. They arrive from the process. And then to major events which are uh, 
um, you know, the birth of my daughter, the birth of my son, the death of my first partner, and certain traumatic event that I had to, to elaborate through the painting and I'm still struggling with until today, you know. So this is just to say, first of all, it's a whole program, Tina, and we will not achieve it now. But in the writing, I can refer those who are interested to more writing on these specific um, questions on each of the direction you are, you are pointing to. I will only remind when I, when I developed the concept of fascinance, which is 2005, right? In, in print, it is 2005, the article on fascinance. I talk about the fact that one of the needs of a self or subjectivity in becoming is not like Winnicott would have it, that the mother is a perfect mirror. Precisely, there is a desire for, for these faraway zones, very sometimes mysterious, where the person who takes care of you does not only reflect to you what you feel and what you need and what you want, etc. It's not a perfect mirror, but is also fascinated by other domains of life. She's a woman or a man or she lives or he lives or they live in a body that desires. And this, there are desires that do not concern the, the, the subject in becoming towards its mother. But the, no, the whole notion of empathy is, you know, I take it somewhere else and say empathy is not enough if we want to, to uh, consider another basis for subjectivity, then empathy to the, to the self is not, uh, is not enough. I talk about empathy within compassion or compassion and empathy always, you know, uh, isolate somebody um, in, uh, and, and the, from the rest of its own world. And so is this what we are teaching one another? How you can be isolated from the rest of those that care for you or you care about. It's a huge question for psychoanalysis, but it is also a question for artists. When you just give a mirror to what you see, then it's, for me, is not very interesting. That's the point of the artists also that you, Tina, is interested in. So I'd like to refer everybody to the writing of Tina as well on art and the matrix here. Brilliant. Thank you, Tina. And thank you, Bracha. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions here and considerably less time than we have questions. So I'm just going to try to move on quickly here and let people get their questions in. Um, so next, Joanna. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And um, thank you for your work, which has been greatly inspiring for me in the last years. And um, I have two questions that I would like to ask you specifically. Um, one concerns um, the co-emerging and the border linking with the human non-I, um, which to my understanding happens on the level of sensuality and affect and in this shared space of resonance. Um, does it presuppose something like universal language of experience, of, of affect, or do you construct it in some other way? And um, my second question would be, when it comes to self-fragilization, um, which includes trauma, um, amongst other things, very negative um, experiences, is there such a point um, which could actually lead to aggression due to these, due to this kind of border linking. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. First of all, as I say, the moment we are in a certain a connection, it's not only the matrixial that participates in this scenario. 
I'm not saying that this replaces the phallic notions of aggressive and, and I, this does not replace it. It's not in state of it and it's neither better nor worse. It is simply a dimension that we have difficulties to discern and I hope to give a certain language so that we can start to discern it and see how it works and work from it because I think there is much more possibility to sustain the present and imagine a future. And also it's more ethical than the, it's impossible to ignore the, you know, ethics of psychoanalysis as Lacan would put it, but what is it? And how do we, um, arrive to, um, to formulate it and live through it and keep going and keep a future in mind. And the futurality uh, is, is a dimension we didn't have time to speak about today. Uh, but when you mentioned Levinas and he says the feminine is this possibility to imagine a world without me, because he takes it, from the idea that at the extreme of coming into life, the extreme would be the, the woman dying at birth. Again, we fall on that, uh, that uh, um, problematics of the, 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 the well, to imagine the, 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 the pregnancy of a process means both of us need to be alive. So it's another kind of futurality when you realize that I and non-I, it's not about either me or you on any level, whether, whether it's a nice level or a negative level, it's not about either me or you. Okay? It's about giving us more possibilities to realize a dimension in which this does not work. It doesn't mean it does not continue to function at the same time. And so, but then what are our means to approach ourselves and the other when we feel the negative, the aggressivity, not the negativity, mounting? Doesn't it happen, you know, for some people 12 times a day? for others uh, a bit less, but there's no denial of whatever affective uh, zones we enter. But what I say, we cannot deny the resonance of the affectivity that ar co-arises. So if we don't ignore this resonance, then we deny a bit less, I mean, we have to do with a zone that is too denied, too foreclosed. Foreclosed is uh, worse because when it is foreclosed, it means that when, when you glimpse at it, you, you either have to understand yourself as crazy or somebody else is crazy. Next question. Thanks, Joanna, and thanks, Bracha. Um, I'm going to move we on can to put together all the rest, remain questions and see if I could at least That's a very good idea. the question. Um, we are, we're kind of over time now, but I don't want to close people off. So Haim and Anna, um, if I can ask Haim first, if you can ask your question, then I'll move to Anna and then we'll go to Bracha and see if Bracha can envelop all the questions into to one answer. Put so, all the okay. questions, so at least I listen to them. Okay. Um, hi, Bracha. Thank you so much. Um, it's really uh, remarkable hearing you articulate things that have always bothered me. But of course, as a as an artist, also in your theoretical work, you are able to to articulate that which a normal person maybe can't locate. So my my question was all along about the life the life drive. Um, and if you could say more about co-emergence with 
but but then you so, so that was my my main question and then you you touched on uh before speculating about before the subject and it occurs to me that there's a lot of important metaphysical implications um at that place so i i wonder if you have anything um to add there and then finally um uh the stakes here in terms of western culture um in a general way for a general reader maybe i mean there's there's so much i feel so moved and i know that this is important um for you um how 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 do you put this maybe that's the most important question here um what's at stake here um in terms of 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 the life drive and um um the material thank you Brilliant. thanks thanks haim um we'll get an answer in a second we're just going to go to anna for her final question of the evening Hi, um, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture and for organizing this. Um, so I, I just wrote my one question, but then I also like had another one. So I'm, I'm just gonna say it. like the first question was about like, how would you say, um, you know, this whole, your conception of matrixial and of the feminine and, and the life drive, um, what is the difference in like clinical, in, ter in terms of clinical practice? Uh, and if you could just talk about I mean, this is my this is also my my main question. Also, like maybe if you could just give some details, or maybe also if you could, uh, you know, like if you have written about this, I would love to read about it. Like, what what is the does it you know do you think it involves a kind of or different uh, approach to clinical practice and the uh, yes. transference and you know like the relationship between analyst and analyzant, or is it also or or is it you know in a way involved in contemporary psychoanalysis? I mean, do you have something um, of a critique also of clinical practice, or is it more involved in uh, in in contemporary practice? Do you think and um, yeah, how can we just inco incorporate all this in, in clinical practice? And another question was also like uh, linked to what Joanna, I think, asked um, maybe about this um, aggr aggressivity also and different kind of affects that, you know, negative affects in like in, in terms of like not caring or at least and not, you know, ethical. Um, I think that you have also, maybe I'm mistaken, you have written somewhere, somewhere that this matrixial bonds or uh, you know like this uh, matrixial relationships often don't work on like too many people <laughs> like there are this like there it, it can't work on like a mess of people or it like there are people who are uh, linked with this kind of um, this kind of uh, re re relations uh, if, I, if I if I may use this word but it's always like not more than some some number of people so what i'm what i'm asking is that why why is that do you think and and do you think that it's kind of do you uh think that this uh, kind of like negative affects or some, some something like that uh in a way necessitates some kind of phallic structure over this matri over this um you know caring matrixial uh feminine um uh, uh approach or or, or, or relations uh, because, for example, you know, like the psychoanalysis tells us that, you know, like it's impossible to have this uh, ma have this kind of ma ma mother child bonds forever, because then there is, you know, like in in a, in a um, when when there there is a lot of people. I, okay, I'm just very much simplifying, and also I'm losing words. But you know, like there is always some kind of uh, you know you need some 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 kind of guarantee the phallic uh, notion of, of some kind of guarantee or a father figure or something that will regulate the relationships because they, uh, uh, because uh, without that, you would just have, uh, it's impossible to just have caring relationships because you would have some kind of aggressivity and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you would uh, say something about that. Sorry if this second question was a bit not thought, thought out well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So uh, both Anna and Jaime, put a big, big questions. Uh, first of all, we have to understand, I'm not saying that some, some people are able and some are not in the materials. When I say it's not generalized, I mean it is not a relation that can be addressed to the phenomena of the mess, masses. 
because it needs, but everybody is, can be open to it because uh, for each one of us, at a time we are connected with this or with this or with that. We are not connected to a thousand people. We even, we, we are always connected to one or two or three or four or few. And severality as, as a figure, configuration is different from the one and is different from this endless and the masses, but it does not address particular people and other people know because that's, that's not the meaning of what I, I mean. Second thing, I'm not talking, if I'm not talking about the maternal bond only in terms of symbiosis, then I'm not talking about the kind of a cut that have to interfere in the symbiosis. I say if there is a symbiosis, probably something needs to do something about it. But there is on another level, what we keep is not the relation, the bond to the mother or something. What we keep is a way of border linking that resemble this kind of border linking, which is archaic. And therefore it appears in the transference and it appears in life not as I stick to my mother and I need somebody to separate, but as a modus of moving uh, in between one another in parallel to other modes that are more clear to us, like symbiosis and separation that takes aggressivity. I think that we enter here few articles that I wrote and few articles that have been written in the comparison between uh, my theory and Kristeva, it had been treated the question of, you know, how do you understand? Recently, she uses the term reliance, which is my term for border linking and which I think uh, I mean something else in border linking. I prefer to, to keep it to talk about uh, this kind of matrixial links and not navigate the concept to the kind of a bo bond which ends up like Abraham wanting to kill Isaac or vice versa, or the mother swallow the child. I have written few, a number of papers that Anna take the question of the clinical and indicate how to, to work and what for me is uh, what I criticize in psychoanalysis in general, but in all kinds of psychotherapies as well, not only psychoanalysis because it's a, it's, it's a more general question. And so there are two papers um, that I can recommend, maybe three of three papers. Um, one is uh, indeed the first paper on Sylvia Platt. I can give you the reference. And the other is what uh, the paper called Laius Complex, where I simply showed the huge mistake when the analyst joined forces through empathy with a certain position of the infant which needs to rebel and turns help to turn this rebellion into hate and destroy not the paternal or maternal figure, but the matrixial basis of relationship itself. So of course, if, if I come with another dimension, it on certain papers, it takes into looking crit very critically even on certain psychoanalytical practice. And mainly I hinted that empathy without compassion is thus, uh, which is uh, a usual tool in therapy, uh, I think is a catastrophe for the future I, Because what we are doing is we are in empathy with the self and we, uh, as if to destroy other connectivity will build the self. And in fact, um, mostly it means I may be in relation to somebody, but I reject its other others. 
This is the co contribution of certain psychoanalysis to the disaster of society today. Couldn't say it more clearly. And as to the metaphysical side, just to say something about this, Chaim, when I get into the metaphysical in my paper, or when I get into the question of transcendence, I jump the line. So you have to read it. And what a perfect place to end. Bracha, it's 10 o'clock UK time, which means it's very close to midnight where you are. And I think this is a, a good opportunity to, to stop. Thank you so much for an incredibly rich two hours of talk, discussion, ideas. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, and if you can, please join us on Wonder. And if you could also um, follow Lacan in Scotland on YouTube, on Facebook, um, or just sign up to our website and you'll get notification of future meetings. Um, and we'll be back in January um, and then February and March with more speakers. But for this evening, Bracha, thank you so much. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Next time in Scotland, in real, in body. Absolutely. I will hold you to that. Okay. Thank you.